I'm thrilled and pleased and honored to be kicking off this year's campus conversations with our new athletic director, Jim Knowlton. Thanks for joining us, Jim. Um, just a little bit about the format. Again, you have on your chair uh, index cards. If you have questions now, write them out. Hand up, uh, hold up the card, and LaDonna will pick them up. And during the conversation as well, if you have questions that come up, there's one right there. Questions that come up, feel free uh, to send them forth. Um, the format, as usual, will be I'm going to ask Jim to start off with just some brief opening comments. I've got a few questions of my own, and then we'll open it up to a discussion, a uh, full discussion and conversation. These have been great events in the past. And again, we're going to continue this throughout the year with a number of uh, campus leaders, ending again with Chancellor Chris towards the end of the semester. Um, so stay tuned for news of those future events. But without further ado, Jim, have at it. Well, Dan, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for coming today. I have just hit my three-month mark here. And uh, I don't think my feet have touched the ground yet. So I love it more than I did when I took the job. And that's a good thing. So. Um, I thought today I would just tell you what I've been doing in, in my first three months, give you an idea of uh, what's consumed my time, and then uh, open it up for questions. But uh, one of the things that I started off with by saying was, I'm going to do a lot of listening. And for three months, I've really done a lot of listening. Uh, in the department, we did listening days, which was a very deliberate way to meet all 30 teams and to also meet the 15 business units in our department. And, we had 75 minutes with each group. It was a SWOT analysis enhanced for athletics. So, you know, your strengths and weaknesses, opportunities, threats, but we really made it bigger than that. What do you think we could do as a department? So if you're in the locker room after a great workout, what are you saying to your, your friends about, boy, if I were the AD, this is what I'd be doing, or if I were the chancellor, this is what I'd be doing. And so we really, really had some good discussions. I sent it a month before I got here. And what I heard from our department was, We've not really ever sat down and talked about what we do well and uh, you know, what we need some work on. So very valuable, and, and from that, I um, have gathered a lot of feedback, and it really accelerated my understanding of the department. I've also been out listening to the alums, and I think uh, Herb has told me I'm somewhere between six and 700 alums that I've met in my first three months, and I've been to D.C. and New York City, and I've been to Orange County and L.A. a few times, and uh, and. Hollywood and Menlo Park, and, and really, it's been phenomenal because the passion from our alums and their willingness to provide feedback has been incredible. Um, That's always a problem here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's been really good feedback, and, I, and I've really wanted to get a sense for where do people think we are right now. And so um, a lot of good feedback, and I've really been doing a lot of listening with our alums. And then the third part, the third sort of the third leg of the stool has been getting out and meeting our chancellor's cabinet, meeting our faculty. And as you may know, I used to teach uh, civil engineering at West Point in a previous life. So I feel like um, I can get out and connect with both sides of the aisle. And, and really my job is to how do we bring athletics and, and make them more integrated into the campus. And so, so from those 30 days, uh, we've developed a, a list from one to N of the things that we want to fix. We want to improve. That'll help us on our journey from, from good to great. And we'll use that to develop our vision. And then over the next 18 months, we'll develop a strategic plan that'll be nested in the strategic plan that the university has been working on. And so um, I'm excited about that. I think until we do have a vision statement and a strategic plan, everyone's going to have an opinion of what success looks like in athletics. And, and um, we have 450,000 alums, and we have 450,000 different ideas of what success looks like in athletics. And so we really have to get all that information and decide what do we consider a successful world-class athletic program here at uh, UC Berkeley. And that's, that's what we're working on right now. I thought I would give you just a couple things that I'm focused on as we move forward. Um, one of them is providing, and this is the center of gravity for our athletic department, is providing a world-class developmental experience for student athletes. I think that's first and foremost what we have to do. That's really what our charter is. Um, in addition, we've got to come up with a long-term sustainable uh, financial model that'll help us support uh, this world-class operation that, uh, that we are. And uh, that's going to be tough, but we've been looking at it in a lot of different ways. And I think that um, when you look at an athletic department and you look at of uh, you know, the 1,500 schools that have athletic departments, I think 14 
are self-sustaining, don't require any university support, uh, the, and we don't look like any of those 14, nor do we want to, right? That's not who we are. We're scholar athletes, and we're at a world-class educational institution so, and research university. So what does it look like for us? What does support look like for us, and uh, how do we move forward? Uh, we want to have, uh, we want to be compliant with Title IX prong one, and that is what the Chancellor has challenged us to do. It's the right thing to do. It's all about equity, and, uh, and we're going to embrace that, and we're going to make that uh, work by 2021, uh, which is what the Chancellor has challenged us with. And then a couple other things is, I feel like athletics can be a great, um, a, 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 is a great way to really build affinity and, and really build community. And so how do we use, for instance, a football game to be more than a football game and to use it to be a platform for our university to celebrate exceptional? And so I've been talking to faculty, I've been talking to deans, how do we celebrate what's going on in your areas um, at halftime, at the 30 yard line between quarters, um, out in front in Goldman Plaza, how do we have the concrete canoe team and the solar car team and the robotics team out there alongside of some of our teams that are going to be out there doing demonstrations in Goldman Plaza. So if you bring a son or a daughter and you come to a game, you're getting more than just watching a football game. You're getting to really sort of look behind the curtain of what is UC Berkeley and what else goes on besides just a football game. So we really think that's important. And then the last thing is just building a culture of, uh, of excellence in our athletic department. I think that's important. So, so that's what I'm focused on. And I, I thought I would just share a couple highlights from the last couple weeks. Um, we had our first student athlete welcome back of uh, Big C Society barbecue. And uh, it, it wasn't our first time doing this, but it was the first time every team came, every coach came, 850 athletes. The chancellor talked to our student athletes. And, and really, for us, it's about building family, bringing everybody together. And uh, I, I thought, and from the feedback, it was a great opportunity for us to bring that family together. So that was fun. We did a welcome back, or a really a welcome to the family for all the uh, athletes' parents that came. So for the first time ever, we brought them together and let them meet each other. And uh, I think the synergy there is going to be important. And again, we're trying to build lifelong affinity for our university, and I think that's important to do. And then, if you didn't see it, we had our football team and our volleyball team out helping our students move in on move-in day. And so what better way to get a workout than carrying some suitcases up and down the stairs for, for a few hours? So the coach was really excited about that, and my hat's off to Coach Wilcox for, for making that happen. Uh, um, it, really, it really was, I think, special and, and brought, integrated our team um, so they're not just someone that they see on the field. And, and as a result of that and some of the other things that our marketing and ticketing teams have been doing, last year at this moment, we had sold 2,300 season tickets to students. Right now, as of today, um, we're at 4,500 plus. And so we're excited about that because we really feel like that's one of the ways that uh, they're going to become, you know, going to meet friends. They're going to become lifelong uh, supporters of our university. So, so with that, I'm excited. I'm excited to hear what you're thinking. And I see some athletic department folks out there. Um, hopefully, they're softball questions from them, and the hard ones come from others. But, but I really, I mean, I, I really want you to get to know where we're going and uh, and answer anything else that you have. So, go Bears! Thanks, Jim. So I'm going to exercise my moderator's prerogative and throw you a few questions of my own before we open it up. Right. So when I first heard you were hired, I have to say that I was struck. I mean, you came from the Air Force Academy. Um, you'd been at West Point, uh, you'd been on active duty with the Army, rose to a uh, rank of colonel, deployed to Iraq. I'm pretty sure there have been very few uh, athletic directors at this university who have an air assault badge. Um, <laughs> and I had to wonder what your friend said. I mean, did they say, you understand that they're all a bunch of socialists, they're barely American, and they don't take orders. So, I mean, <laughs> so what did people say, and how are you thinking about it when this opportunity first rose up? Well, the first word I think that everyone said was, what? <laughs> uh, but after, after I talked to them a little bit about it, and in my background, my, both my parents were educators. So my dad was a college professor. Uh, my mom was a, uh, an elementary school teacher. And, and so education's been a huge part of my life. And so when you see an opportunity at the number one public university in the country, um, it gets you excited. And so uh, the more I learned, the more I studied, the more I researched about UC Berkeley and and really 
what this entire university has done over many, many years uh, to impact society, the more excited I got. And so uh, when I talked to them about that and talked to them about uh, a world-class experience for young men and women uh, through athletics, uh, they, they softened a little bit. Yeah, so, uh, but, but I think that's, that's exactly why I'm here. And, and I think the last thing was when I finally met uh, during the interview process, Chancellor Christ, uh, that was sort of the trump card. When I listened to her and she talked about the vision for the university and where we're going and how athletics plays a role in that, uh, uh, I was convinced if offered the job, uh, this would be a great place for me. And so, speaking to the chancellor, you know, just put out a back to school message and you know, clearly we're relieved and pleased that the campus has made significant financial process, mm -hmm. uh, progress, addressing a pretty significant budget deficit. But having said that, the campus spends pretty pretty good amount of money on athletics every year, recently as much as $20 million. And while that's less than 1% of our overall budget, there are people here who think, you know, that may be money that could be better deployed elsewhere. So when you think about that, when you make the argument for the value that accrues to the community, to the mm -hmm. institution, how do you sort of explain to people and justify the extent to which the campus does invest in our intercollegiate athletics program? I think it's a great question, and I think for me, um, I would start by saying we provide a world-class developmental experience for student athletes. That's first and foremost, and um, for them to be able to get this incredible education while also competing and representing Cal on the national and international stage, uh, I think that's, that's certainly key. And, and I would say we're many times the front porch of the university, and so um, that's, that's sort of step one. Step two, I would say, is uh, we also get a chance to celebrate our brand nationally and internationally. And if you're on ESPN and you have, you're in 110 or 120 million households, and we use that to celebrate not just a football team, but we celebrate all the other things that are wonderful about Cal and UC Berkeley, um, that is really important. And so we have institutional messages when we're on TV that aren't athletic focused, but are university focused. And I think. Uh, that really helps us get the word out on what a great place uh, that we work at. And so, um, yes, there are 100 and, or there's 1,500 universities in the country that have athletics. Uh, I think at last count, 14 of them don't have institutional support, and they don't look like us. We don't want to be like them either, right? We're very different than what they are. And so I think there's an investment, to just as there is in the history department and some of the other places of, of education on campus and um, I think the investment in us may be more than I would like. I think we have some great opportunities to generate more revenue, to be more philanthropic, and those are the things that we're focused on and we're gonna work hard on. Uh, but there is an investment to provide this world-class opportunity. And last question, at least from my part, until, uh, before we get to questions from the audience. What's going on inside the department? I mean, I think there have been some difficult years. There have been some ups and, ups and downs within Cal Athletics. How did you read the morale? What are you doing about it? How are things inside the family there? Um, I think one of our biggest challenges is we've had 210 people leave in the last three years out of an organization of 300. So, um, and they leave for many reasons. They leave because the cost of living is high. They leave because they start as an entry-level person and then become a you know, they go from a volunteer assistant to a second assistant and to a first assistant. And so for many of them, we want, we encourage them to get some great experience and then take the next step to, to be in an assistant coach or to take it over their own, you know, budget program or whatever their area of field is. But I think we can also do a better job with our family, you know, sort of building morale, finding those opportunities where we can bring the family together and, and uh, make it a place that people enjoy coming to work. And uh, we're working on that. You know, I think we've got some great opportunities. And uh, we had our first uh, all staff meeting and uh, we did shout outs. And it was amazing the incredible work that's happening inside our department that many times people don't hear, uh, including great cross, uh, really integration across campus. People are working with departments and people are working with the educators uh, on different projects. And so I think. I think sometimes people don't know the things that are happening in athletics, and I think the more we tell the stories, the better people will understand, wow, this is a value added to our university. Super. So I'm going to turn to your questions now with just a reminder, if as we go along you have additional questions you want to pose for Jim, jot it down in a card, throw your hand up in the air, LaDawn will come around and pick it up, but don't hesitate as we're in the course of the conversation. 
So the first one, the first question here is, Jim, what's one thing or an area that Cal isn't doing that Air Force, where you last worked as athletic director, did well that you can bring over, you know, as an area to improve? It's a great question. I think um, one of the things we talked about yesterday, we had a uh, cabinet retreat, and um, one of the side conversations was about CTE and concussions and, and the challenges with um, where we are. And one of the things at Air Force that was very, very valuable is we were uh, at the cutting edge of research, both with DOD, uh, the Department of Defense provided us a significant amount of money, and the NCAA did. And um, we're doing a lot of that research here, uh, but I think there's more resources that we can get to that can help us um, even do more to improve uh, how we look at and protect you know, the health of our student athletes. Uh, right now, um, we had looked at putting uh, sensors in helmets, and we found that um, even better than that is we now have our players with sensors on their bodies so you can track where they are, acceleration, reduction in acceleration, and really look at where there are times where they're having impacts that could affect, um, that could affect them. And so uh, that gives our trainers insight right away. And, and I think there's more that we can do, um, both from my influence with rules in the NCAA um, and also with how we protect, and then what we do when an injury does occur and how we, we help our student athletes get back to health. And so that's one of the areas that, that I'm already talking with Ryan Cobb, uh, who oversees our uh, medical support. Super. Um, so the next question is, can you describe how you will approach developing the strategic plan for athletics and specifically, how you will ensure it is aligned with the campus strategic plan. And I think part of that may also come from, I think in recent years, there was a little bit of a sense of us and them. It was like the campus and Cal athletics as opposed to mm -hmm. all joined together. So I think that's an in that context, an interesting question about your own approach to the strategic right. plan and how you're lining up with what's happening across the campus. Right. I, I mean, I probably could sit down in my office and in the next three hours write our strategic plan from my perspective, but that is not helpful for our campus. And so uh, the way, and the reason it takes 18 months, just like what we're seeing with the university's strategic plan development is you start putting some ideas down on paper, you throw a little bit of the meat on the bones, and then you go out and you talk and you communicate. And much like uh, I've been out talking to faculty, talking to staff, and talking to our own department, uh, you do that during the development of a, of a strategic plan. You put some committees together and you get feedback from all corners of the university and, and also our alumni base. And I think uh, that helps you get a plan that everyone will embrace and, and everyone will support. And then it becomes not the athletic director's plan, but it becomes our strategic plan. And do you have, in, in the context of that planning process, do you have any sort of overarching objectives? I mean, not specifics about the vision, but do you come into it with an idea of what a world-class intercollegiate athletics program should look like and embody? I think I, I come in here with what I, what I think would make us world-class, and then when you do listening days and talk to multiple constituencies, uh, you sort of frame that a little bit different because it's now what would work best here uh, at UC Berkeley. What would be Nirvana here? And so what's Nirvana at the Air Force Academy or at West Point or at RPI is not necessarily the exact same here. And so how do you, through these committees, figure out what really makes sense uh, when you talk about a world-class athletic department? And so that's, that's really the refining of what happens over the course of those you know, 15 to 18 months. Got it. Um, so the next one has to do with a subject that is near and dear to the hearts of many who follow Cal football, and it's the television scheduling on the time of games. As people may know, we've had a lot of evening games, and people miss the daytime games. So the specific question is, what data has the athletic department considered in reflection to the, or in relation to the Pac-12 television scheduling and the attendance at football games, because there has been a drop off in recent years that some ascribe to the fact that games are being played at night and or we don't know when games are gonna be until perhaps just a few days before the weekend. So first off, I'll say the two, the two most asked questions that I've had in all of these events that I've been at, and, and I've been at a lot of events. The first one is, 
when are we going back to the Rose Bowl and will I see it in my lifetime? So, so that's the first one I'm always prepared to answer. And you know, of course, my first question is how old are you? So I know how much, how much time I have to work with. Um, and then the second one is, is this. And the first time I spoke, um, I talked to about 100 people down in LA and this question came up and I said, you're kidding me. I took this job because I thought all of our games were at noon. When I was at the Air Force Academy, they're at 8.15, and many of them, it was below freezing when at kick. I said, are any of our games below freezing at kick? And they said, no. I said, oh, this is going to be a great job. And of course, <laughs> I, I almost got booed off the stage. But uh, it's a big problem. And I think every single athletic director across the country is dealing with this problem because um, the exposure on TV is phenomenal. The resources that they provide um, to have the rights to show our our games, it's what allows us to provide a world-class experience. The problem is it is hurting attendance around the country. And if there's one AD that will tell you it's not hurting their attendance, give me their number because um, either they're telling a large fib or they've broken the code that nobody else has broken. And so um, we really work hard to talk about how we can do better, but until 2023, when our TV contract is, is finished with uh, the current contract, we are where we are. Um, I, think, I think the pressure on ESPN is now starting to build because they're seeing the challenges, they're seeing the fan pushback. So they're looking at other ways, as are we, and as we start unbundling some of the, uh, some of the ways that people can watch our games, um, we're, gonna see, we're gonna see something different in 2023. I don't know what it's gonna look like, and, you know, I spent a lot of time looking in my crystal ball to see what it might be, uh, but we're talking a lot, and we spent a lot of time at the, Mount, at the uh, Pac-12 talking about um, what are we going to do next? What are we going to do that will allow us to still have the resources that we get now, but also get the exposure that we want, and also pick our times? You know, we'd love to be somewhere between 11 and 3. And what's amazing is in our league, there are teams that only want night games. So you can imagine that schools that don't want to be playing at noon because it's 115 degrees. So they're in a great spot. All their games are at night. They want them at night. And uh, I'm thinking, boy, what a, great, what a great spot that is to never have to worry about night games because everyone wants night games. So we're in a different spot, and um, we're working it, and we're talking about it. But, uh, yeah, the data shows night games hurts our attendance. It hurts our family attendance. Now, there are others that will tell you, I have two young kids. I do their soccer games during the day. I get a babysitter, and then my wife and I go at night. So, so some people like the night games, but um, by and large, we'd rather, we'd rather be kicking between 11 o'clock and, and 3 or 4 o'clock. Thanks. And speaking of resources, um, the next question has to do with philanthropy. As many of you know, the Chancellor commissioned an outside consultancy, Collegiate Sports Athletics, take a look at revenues and expenses in intercollegiate athletics. One of its findings was the program's currently leaving a lot of money on the table in terms of philanthropy. And so this question says, from a fundraising perspective, how do you view the need to collaborate across the institution to build athletics and academic, or to support athletics and academic interests? In other words, moving away from a zero-sum game mentality, mentality to one of partnership and strong communications. So maybe address that question, just on a broader level, what you're thinking about in terms of tapping into the full potential of the Cal Athletics community in terms of philanthropic support. And I think if you read the Martz and Lundy report, uh, what they say more than anything else is UC Berkeley has the largest upside for philanthropy of any school they've ever looked at. And, um, and it reminds me a little of Air Force. Air Force was fully funded for years and years and years, so there was no need to fundraise. And we used to get 100% of our support through University of Cal, I mean through the state of California. I don't know if anybody knows, but we're not 100% funded anymore. <laughs> Might, is that something new to anybody? Um, and, and I think our philanthropy machine is really still cranking up. And you know, we had a record year last year, 567 million dollars. 69. Of, 69, sorry. 69 million dollars of philanthropy and and in the athletic department, we had 30 million, which was our five-year high. Um, now people say, well, then you must be cash flush. 
The problem with philanthropy is, you know, many of these gifts are over many years, or many of them are, are gifts uh, when you pass, so it's not money in your pocket right now, uh, but it's a commitment, and that's important. And I think for us, when you look at our donors, many of our donors, their first gift, their second gift, and their third gift were to athletics, but their next 10 were across the campus, which is really the way it should be. We build affinity with our athletic program, and then that affinity helps them branch out and support other places. And I, I looked at probably seven just this week of people I was getting ready to meet, and all of them typically had gifts early on to athletics because they were athletes, and then the next thing you know, they're given to the business school or the law school or, or somewhere else on campus. And I think, I think that's important. When I'm out talking to donors, uh, one of my questions is always, what are you interested in now? And if they say, I really, really want to help student services, my next phone call is back to UDAR and saying, hey, this is a great athletic supporter, but they really now want to do this. And I think if everybody's doing that, that $569 million goes to a billion dollars a year. I mean, that's the capacity that we have. And so uh, it's a team effort. Uh, in our department, I mean, that's what we preach every day is how do you build great teams? And I think uh, when it comes to fundraising, our whole university has to be a great team uh, to realize our potential. So let me follow up with you there. So when you have asked donors, what are you interested in supporting? What are you hearing? What, what are, where are the connection points that the biggest supporters and donors are not even the biggest, just across the board? What do they say? You know what's amazing? Most of them say, what do you need? What does the university need? How can I help? And those are the best questions to get. And, and unfortunately for me, for my first three months, I've, I've given everyone the Heisman and said, I don't know what I need. I really don't. But I know where you are. I know your phone number. Do you mind if I come back once I do know what we need and have another conversation? And every one of them says, absolutely, come back. And so um, I think our alums want to see us remain the number one public university in the country and they are willing to help us in whatever way we, from the chancellor on down, say is the best way to do that. And so that's exciting. Super. Um, next has to do sort of an interaction with the uh, academic side of the house. It says, there are a number of faculty and scholars on campus who do research and teach on sports and society. Would you be interested in learning more about this work? Perhaps there are ways to bridge between the scholarship and athletics here. Absolutely, and uh, our first all staff meeting the first speakers uh, were two of our faculty members that run SCET, is that right, S-C-E-T. Um, so Danielle and Stephen came and they talked about the programs that they're, um, that they're running and how there is this intersection between academics and athletics and how they wanna continue to improve that. And I think that partnership could be happening everywhere on campus. I mean, there's so many ways uh, that we could work together, and as a former academic, I would love uh, to be part of that. So who asked that question? Can I, can I get your information afterwards? It's on there? Perfect. Uh -oh. That would be great. Thanks. Here you go. All right, there it is. <laughs> um, next one here is, uh, this is sort of interesting. How important is it to you that uh, student athletes find gainful employment after graduation? And maybe take that and run with it a little bit about in terms of what you want to do and what you want to see in terms of ensuring that student athletes take full advantage of all that's on offer here. So both the employment question and the academic question for student athletes. Sure. So I would say this, um, our student athletes are going to go pro after they graduate in something normally other than their sport, right? They're going to go pro in something. Other. Now there are a few. Here's a perfect example of one right here who's, who's our shining star in the department who Spent 10 years in the, 10 years in the NFL? 10 years in the NFL, but he's the exception. Most are gonna go on to do great things in something other than their sport. And so um, we have to prepare them. I mean, that's really the developmental experience. And um, as we talked, when I had all 850 student athletes together this week, it's really embracing all that is UC Berkeley. There are so many opportunities, and I think, I think your head can almost you almost pop just trying to figure out how do I do everything that you can do here because there is so much to do and what we want to do is make sure that they are getting career development. They're getting great education, 
they're getting exposed to faculty members that are leaders in their, in their fields. One of them was prong three, which is where we've been for years, was you're meeting the needs of the underrepresented sex. And so what that meant was you're providing sports, and if nobody's coming forward each year and saying we'd like to have, we'd like to have a triathlon team for women, um, if no one's doing that, then you've met the requirement of Title IX. What you haven't met is it's not, you haven't provided equal opportunities, um, but you've met the requirement. And then prong two says you're working your way to prong one, and prong one is proportionality. And so proportionality means if we have 52% of our undergraduates are female, then 52% of our intercollegiate opportunities should be for females. And so right now we're skewed. We are not there. And uh, that's the challenge that the chancellor has given me is we have to provide an equitable amount of opportunities based on the percentage of undergraduates um, in each of the sexes. And so uh, I completely and 100% embrace that. I believe in it. It's the right thing to do. And, um, and I think we're working our way towards that. And, and you know, in the facility realm that you talked about, um, we had just not taken care of business for many years. And as a result, uh, we didn't have equitable facilities for males and females. And I think um, what we're going to do with softball and, and uh, beach volleyball is going to help us provide equitable facilities uh, for both our, our men and our women. Thanks. Um, moving on to a different subject, the question is, what is your stance on longtime campus traditions pertaining to athletics like the California Victory Common? Do I have that right? Cannon? Oh, cannon, sorry. Um, card stunts, et cetera. Are you willing to fight for their continuation? This is a loaded question. <laughs> yes. Next question. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, I haven't seen, except on TV, I've never been to a game. And so I'm so excited to get to a game in person and not watch it on TV. I, I mean, I've seen the, the play at least... 50 times already, but, but really to, uh, to be part of and see the traditions, but I absolutely believe in them. And so, yes, we will continue to battle to make sure that those continue to be part of, uh, uh, of the game day experience. Well, what makes tradition such an important thing, particularly in the intercollegiate ath uh, athletics realm? It seems like every university, it's like almost mm -hmm. like a religion, right? I think it ties the generations of alums mm -hmm. and supporters. I think when you come to a game after 50 years of going to a game, there are just some things that you expect to see every game. And when you don't, um, your affinity goes down. And I think um, we want to have a family environment. We want to have a fan experience second to none. And we want those traditions uh, to continue on as people teach their kids and their grandkids what it means to be a Cal Bear. So, I mean, given that love that so many fans of intercollegiate athletics have, uh, given the love they have for traditions, does that make change harder? I think it does. I think it makes change hard, and I think change is already hard anyways. Um, but, but I think you look at the traditions and how do you keep them and still improve the fan experience. You know, I've heard so many things about improving the food, improving some of the other amenities that we have. Those are things that don't change tradition, but certainly make it a lot more fun to come to a game, and that's, that's really what we're trying to do. So here's a question from someone for whom change apparently isn't happening fast enough. It says, update please. What's going on with the Rec Sports locker room installation and uh, new changing and shower spaces? It's been over a year in construction, Jim. <laughs> Do you know? Do you have any update on that, and and perhaps just a little bit broader about how you see yeah. the relationship with rec sports and intercollegiate athletics? I will have to admit, I do not know. I do not have an update on the. I did not know that was a project that was going on. So uh, I will. I will. Do you have your information on the back of your card? No. If you would, whoever it is, um, give me. I will, I will get an answer for you, and I'll respond to that. Um, what I think, in a broader scale, where I came from, I was in charge at, at Air Force. I, I had under our organization, both the intercollegiate, the intramural, um, and um, the PE. And so I don't want nor need that, but I know we were better because we had a great relationship and we had a great partnership. And so I think that's really what I need to do. We just, we just have a new uh, person 
uh, for PE. I think this was his first week. I met him in his first week, and we've already are working to get on the calendar together, and the same with, with Rec Sports. I think we need to be partners. We need to work together, and I think we all win uh, when we have a good partnership. So, so that's, that's going to be my goal. Um, so the next question actually circles back to something you said earlier, that we don't necessarily want to look like those 14 institutions that have mm -hmm. balanced budgets. And it's a good question. Why not? Why don't we want to look like campuses with financially independent athletics departments? Sounds like it would help Berkeley's structural deficit. Good question. So it's a great question. The reason we don't, don't want to look like many of them uh, is because they don't have scholar athletes. I mean, some of them are actually... You, I don't want to say pro sports, but but their focus is I think athletics. You just did, I yeah, think. no, yeah, that, <laughs> block that from the screen. Uh, no, but I think that their focus is totally different than our focus. Our focus is we are going to have scholar athletes. We're going to get a great education. We're going to experience a developmental experience. And and there are other schools that are doing really, really well financially that are focused on getting their kids to the pro ranks, and that's exclusively what they're doing. Uh, that's not us. And you know, the the chancellor and I had Jalen Brown. Uh, we were together with, uh, with him in her office last week. And if you don't know Jalen, he was here for a year, and now he's a superstar for the Celtics and just an absolutely incredible young man. Uh, at uh, age 20, he was a speaker at the Harvard uh, School of Education, the youngest ever and the biggest crowd ever. And um, he came here and then was on his way to talk at a tech convention. And, and he talked about just the one-year at Berkeley and how it sort of flipped the switch for him and his intellectual in, in inquisitiveness. It just, he just felt like so challenged intellectually here um, that he really misses that. Being a pro, he said, I really miss that, that stimulation that I got. And uh, we're working hard to get him back and find ways that he can continue his education and get his, uh, and get his Berkeley degree. That's really what we'd like to do for him. And that sort of leads right into the next question, which is, what's your plan to make sure our athletes grow up to be upright citizens of the community? So beyond their performance in the classroom, beyond their performance on the field of play, do you see the program as having additional responsibilities in terms of personal development mm -hmm. and the kind of things that this, this person is asking? No, absolutely. And, and at our um, lunch, that was one of the things we talked about. You know, I, talked, I called it my real discussion. I have five sons. And... Um, our 850 student athletes got my dinner table discussion. I mean, my kids probably have it labeled, oh, that's speech number 31 or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> but really it was, you're ambassadors for our program, you're very visible, and everybody knows who you are. And we expect you to hold yourselves uh, to a higher standard. And I think my most important job that I do is hire great coaches. Because our great coaches spend a lot of time with those student athletes and develop, developing them both in the pool, on the field, and then also off the field. And, uh, and that's really critical uh, to having a great athletic department. And so uh, our coaches are a key cog in that. And I feel like that's why I wanted to talk to all 850. I wanted them to hear it from me, that these are the things I expect of you with respect to sexual violence and sexual harassment, with respect to many other things that you're reading about in the paper and other athletic departments. And so if, if I don't have the courage to stand up and talk to them about it, and our coaches don't have the courage to stand up and talk to them about it, then how do we expect them to, to behave and develop the way we really feel it's important to become model citizens? So I'm going to hit you with another hard question, because you talked a little bit about Jalen Brown, and you know I know he's an exceptional human being. But at the same time, what do you think about the one and done phenomenon? where student athletes come, play basketball for a year, sort of use this as sort of a farm yep. league for the NBA, and then they're gone. How do you feel about that? I, I think most of us ADs and in the college space would love to see a model like baseball or football where you have to stay for two or three years because then you're, you're close enough that you can get an education. You can get your degree. When you've only been here a year, it's going to be a lot of hard work for Jalen to be able to come back and, and get his degree. And I think... Um, I think there's also young men and women who um, don't really want to go to college. They don't want to get an education. Uh, they're majoring in eligibility. <laughs> and those are at those schools that are financially stable that I, I said we don't want to be like. Um, we don't want that. If you don't want to come to college, you want to get an education, there's got to be a path for you to go straight to the pros. And you may be just so good that you're ready to be a pro. And so 
I think that's what the NBA Players Association is working on right now is how do we make a new rule that allows them to come straight to the pros, whether it's the G League or whether it's the NBA. And then if you make the decision you want to come to college, then you're here for two or three years and we get you close to a degree and we can get you back. Um, because the bottom line is we want everyone that we bring to Cal to get an education, to get a degree. Great. Um, talking again about the pro sports thing, this question, uh, your thoughts on paying players in high revenue sports and players unionizing, as I'm sure everybody knows, that's been an issue on the front burner. Um, the institutions and the networks and the advertisers, a lot of people profiting, the players, some claim, are not really seeing their just rewards from mm -hmm. their efforts in the realm. Others say they're getting great education yeah. or an opportunity. Pretty divisive debate. Where do you fall out on all that? So I, I really believe that the model, this, this amateurism model, is, um, is a really good model. Now, is it perfect? No, it is not. But when you add up what a student athlete uh, receives as part of his education at Cal, and it's not just the tuition, the books, the cost of attendance, but it's a world-class strength and conditioning support, world-class training support, world-class academic support center. We've got, I think, Derek, yep, Derek is right here. I mean, those things, we don't put a price tag on, but those things are absolutely huge investments for our university and our athletic department to provide a world-class experience. And I think when you look at all of those things that we're providing, um, it is an absolute life-changing opportunity uh, to be there. I told our student athletes this week that if you're sitting in those seats that you're sitting at, you basically won the Willy Wonka golden ticket, right? That is a golden ticket that you may not even realize how key it is right now, but an opportunity to compete at the highest level, Power Five, Pac-12, and also get a world-class education, it doesn't get any better. And, and again, when you're only 18, it's hard for them to really understand what a golden ticket it is. But if you talk to some of us who have been through and, and now can look back, it's game-changing, it's life-changing, um, it's career-altering, and uh, so it is, the golden ticket. So, uh, I know, I know that you played varsity hockey at West Point, I right? did. How have things changed for student athletes since your day? The equipment's a lot better. <laughs> I wouldn't have got half as many stitches if I had those nice face masks when I played. Uh, you know, I think, I think some things haven't changed. I think balancing um, academics and athletics is a challenge in 1978 when I started, and, and it is today. It's really... How do you balance, how do you, how do you find a way uh, to be exceptional in both? And you know, our tennis coach said a funny thing to our incoming freshmen. Um, there are three things, he's, this, this, this was really a, a kind of a funny thing, but he said there are three things you can do in college. You can party, you can study, and you can do your sports. But you can only be world class in two of them. And he said, I've had students try to be world-class on all three, and failed. And so I, I use that sort of jokingly, but really it teaches them how do you really balance? Because um, you think that once you get out of college, then balancing is over. Does anybody have to work on balancing every day? <laughs> I mean, there's not a day that goes by that you're not balancing family and kids and budgets. And, and, and really, I think it gives them a huge jump start into how do you balance and how do you maintain um, some sanity at the same time that you're balancing. And I think that's one of the huge values of uh, this student-athlete developmental opportunity. Super. So speaking of partying, the next person asks, um, as a new source of revenue, what's your thinking of selling alcohol at home games? That's a great question. And I will tell you, when I went to Air Force, um, I listened, just like I am here. And one of the things I heard from fans was, we would love to be able to have a beer at football games. And so we did a lot of research, and, and what we found was our fans felt like they had to do five shots at their car before they then came in, because it was a long walk to get into the stadium. And, uh, and, and that was how they kept their buzz through halftime. And I thought, okay, uh, that may not be exactly the model that we're looking for. Um, now, if you have to walk all the way up from the BART station, maybe that's 10 shots. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so what we found is we did a soft opening 
and uh, we tested it because my main goal was it's got to remain a family environment in the stadium. Um, so we've done beer tents here. You know, this year you'll see some beer tents uh, outside. Me, what's a beer tent? Where they sell they sell beer oh. outside uh, of the stadium, and and we're going to see how we can manage it, how we can maintain a family environment. And uh, I think four Pac-12 schools already are selling alcohol. And uh, what they have found and what I found at Air Force was the number of incidents have gone down, not up. And so, um, so you don't have to do those 10 shots from the BART station as you walk up Bancroft. You can, you can have a $10 beer. And who wants to get drunk on a $10 beer? No. Or whatever it is, yeah. So. Uh, I'm going to go back into the tradition realm here with a okay. question about the Cal Band, which is something I think near and dear to a lot of our yeah. hearts. And the question is, the Cal Band is a student-run marching band that doesn't get paid or receive units, but has served the university for over 100 years. In recent years, we've been moved from field to field, required to set up um, on our own yard lines at Underhill, and had to change practice times as often as twice a week. This complicates our efforts to learn our shows and hinders our ability to serve the university. What can you do to make this better, considering other college bands don't face these obstacles every day or every season? Any, any it's a great question. And what I would say to that one is, please give me your, can I have that one? Yep. Please give me your contact information afterwards. Um, I did not know it was a problem, and certainly, oh, perfect. Sarah, thanks. Um, I would love to help. That shouldn't be the way it is. And um, yeah, let me see what we can do to help. Okay. Because you're part of our team. You're part of the family, and um, yeah, that's that's not how it should be. I'm just, I have to say, I mean, this is the third or fourth campus conversation that I've done, and I've never seen such a wide array of questions. I mean, it's interesting. It speaks yeah. to how much, how many different things athletics is involved in, and so we're going to go back into the money realm at the moment. All right. um, it says Cal Athletics is working towards increasing, uh, decreasing its deficit. How will you keep coaches accountable to achieve this goal, but also carry out a successful program? Again, a question about balance here. All right, which coach asked that question? <laughs> you know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, what the CA report said... Uh, CSA, you mean, CSA, right? I'm sorry. CSA report said was uh, the athletic department is lean and it's very efficient. And so um, when I look at where we are in our budget, you know, when I look at the institutional support each year for our, for our budget, uh, it is a balancing act. And it's how do we provide world-class experience? How do we give the coaches the things they need? And really the answer is we have to generate more revenue. We have to sell more tickets. We have to get more and more people excited about what we're doing. And, uh, and we, have to, we have to really rev up our philanthropy. And I think, um, I think we're working on every one of those. And I think that's going to pay dividends to provide those margin of excellence um, resources uh, that allow our coaches to, to continue to improve. So we're going to circle back to the facilities issue, the facilities that uh, new facilities that we'll be building for beach volleyball and okay. softball. I've got two questions in that realm, and I'm going to give them both of you together. Um, so first of all, just an update about where things stand. This person has asked for said they're very excited for beach volleyball, the beach volleyball program. But okay. where do things stand with that? Um, and then the other question here is regarding the uh, $30 million investment for those facilities. It says there seems to be more choices for women's sports than men's. So um, are these costly sports needed? I'm not exactly sure what was meant between the two, but maybe just sort of take, sure. take that up in terms of how you see the future of the program in terms of its scope and men and women, and also a little bit of update of where we are in terms of the facilities. Sure, so I'll do the easy one first, which is the update. And the update is um, we're working on architectural renderings and then design. We've gone out and met the neighbors um, and Clark Kerr, or Clark Kerr for, Kerr. Um, Kerr? Kerr. Kerr. I'm learning, I'm learning. Uh, for, to just talk about the impact and, and what we're gonna do, what it's gonna look like, and then listen again and, and hear what their, what their um, the challenges that this may provide. And so that was a really good session. We got some good feedback, and uh, we'll do the same thing for softball in a couple weeks. And uh, I think from a bigger perspective of why do we have to do this? Well, I think the reason we have to do it is because it's the right thing to do, first and foremost. I mean, I think that's really why we have to do it. The second thing is we just have not, we have not taken care of our women's sports for far too long. And I think when you look at that, I don't think there's anybody in the room who doesn't feel when you say that, like, 
Well, doggone it, that's, that's not UC Berkeley. Why aren't we taking care of all of our student athletes equally? And so, um, so that's what we're working on, and we've got some fundraising to do. Um, I've just been working on putting a committee together and talking to some, um, some major donors who are going to be chairs of the committee, and, and how do we rally to, um, to really get some of our female alums excited about supporting these programs. And so uh, we've got a list of a lot of folks that have said they're interested, and, and now we'll go out and talk to them and, uh, and, and get them excited about supporting. So we've got time for one last question, so I'm just going to ask you. So one easy one after all these it's, hard ones. It's going to be an easy one. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Looking down the road a year from now, mm -hmm. what would enable you to look back in September of 2019 and say, I met my goals. I'm, I've accomplished the things I set out to accomplish. Where do you hope things are a year from now? That's a great question. I think this year is going to be a great opportunity for me to evaluate um, how are we doing with the student athlete experience? You know, how is, that, uh, how is that working? Are we doing everything we can to make this world class? Um, the budget's going to be a big thing. We're going to have a, at least a plan moving forward that's going to continue to reduce the institutional support required uh, for athletics. And, and so if we've got a good plan that I can look at my crystal ball and say, wow, this is going to get us to where we should be um, from institutional support, I think that will be really good. I think Title IX, we're going to continue to refine the plan so that... Um, so in 2021, we feel good about where we're going to be. And, uh, and then really just integrating athletics throughout this community. And at every, at every touch point, I'd love for us to be um, a partner, a teammate um, with faculty, with staff, uh, with everybody, including you know, the town of Berkeley. Um, I think that's important. I think we can be a great driver of building affinity. And, um, and I think that's important. If we can see some strides in that area, I think it'll really be, uh, that'll be a success. Now, I've never had a year where I said it was successful because I'm always pushing and, and wanting, to, wanting to do better, but I think those will be a great start. And I think our internal department, if we can build some esprit de corps and, and feel good about our family, then uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be smiling in a year from now. Super. So uh, before I thank you formally, I just want to remind everybody about Future campus conversations that are coming up in late September, the 25th, we'll have Kathy Koshlin, Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Education, and Fiona Doyle, the Vice Pro Pro Provost for Graduate Division. Then in October, Randy Katz, Vice Chancellor of Research. Um, in November, Julie Hooper, Vice Chancellor for University Development and Alumni Relations. Um, and then in December, uh, Chancellor Carol Christ. Jim, I want to thank you for your transparency, your openness, your generosity of time. Welcome you to the campus, and go Bears. Go thank Bears. You. Thank you.